Hey all, this is Barry and I'm here to teach you some physics. These videos are meant to summarize a unit and today we're hitting the kinematics unit for AP Physics 1, including analyzation of motion in one and two directions. So, let's get to it. Uh, first thing I want to do is match up some basic terms. So we're going to start with position, velocity, and acceleration. They're really what's going to help us define how things move. Position is going to be measured in meters. Just marked as how far something is, where it's located, what that position actually is of an object. The velocity then is going to be uh, denoted as the change in position. So it's going to be meters over a certain amount of time, seconds. So meters per second are what we're going to use there for velocity. And that just means something is moving. And then acceleration means it's going to be moving at a varying rate. So we're going to go to meters per second per second. So we've got our meters still and then seconds two times. OK, so I want to note before we get to this next column here that uh, the zero that you might see associated, like let's say right there, um, denotes time of zero. And that basically means the initial time. OK, so our position is going to just be wherever we are now minus that initial position. So if something moved, we would say, OK, it went from zero meters to 10 meters. It has gone 10 meters. If it went from two meters to 10 meters, then it's gone eight meters. And that's why we look for the difference. The velocity then is going to be that change in position divided by time. OK, so again, we're just going to use our seconds. We're going to have meters per second there. And then acceleration is going to be that change in velocity divided by time as well. And more commonly, you're likely to see them written more like this, where that delta just means the change in. All right, I want to go ahead and jump over to a simulation to help show you how some of these things vary. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to run this simulation on its own. And I want to note that there's no acceleration for either here. So the velocity for the second one, since it's higher, is going to let it overtake the first one, even though it starts at an earlier position. Now, if I go back and I change a couple of these things real quick, I'm going to change my acceleration here for the first one so that it's speeding up as it keeps going. We're going to run this again. And now you'll note that first one wins by a lot because that acceleration, that positive acceleration, causes a great enough jump in the velocity up here that it moves very, very quickly. And one more time, we're going to put this one back to zero. And we're going to change the acceleration of the second one to be negative, meaning it's going to be slowing down. So not only is it going to slow down to let that first one win at this point, but it's going to start heading backwards. That's because the acceleration takes the positive velocity to zero since it's slowing it down. And then it starts to speed it up in the negative direction and thus it ends up going backwards. So a good look there at how these factors can affect each other. Um, moving back here to our presentation, we're going to skip on over to the next one. Beyond those basic terms and those very, very basic equations, we need to know our kinematic equations. So first, we've got our number one right here. This is just a rearranged version of the acceleration equation. If you note, it was A equals delta V over T. All that has been done here is it's been rearranged. And that's really what happens with all of these equations. They've been combined. They've been rearranged. That's all they really are. They're just written out this way. And this is taken exactly from the AP Physics 1 reference tables to make it a little bit easier to see how you could use these. So equation number two is in a spot here where we have time included still. And that's important to note because the next one will not have time in it. But it has this initial velocity noted here. Remember that little zero there means initial. In a lot of cases, we're going to be able to set our problem solving so that the initial velocity is zero, which will get rid of this middle term and will make this a very easy equation to use as well. And then finally, we have our equation number three. There is no time in this one. And that's really important because there's going to be some problems where you're not going to be given time and you're not going to have to solve for time. You're just going to want to know how something moves regardless of the amount of time that it takes. And this equation is very, very helpful in doing that. So again, noted right there, you'll use for problems that do not provide or ask for time. All right, time to look at graphs of motion. We talked briefly about graphs in the unit zero summary video as well. So check back to that if you feel like you need to. But we've got our position time, our velocity time, our acceleration time graph. And we've got a similar but mirrored set of graphs here at the bottom. And I want you to know that each line describes the same motion. Always look very carefully at your y-axis and what is actually being told there on your graphs. And, uh, and that will really help you out here as far as determining what's being said on the graph. So we have a curve here that implies 
not just a change in position, but a changing rate of change in position. So we've got our velocity there that's increasing and thus an increasing velocity is also going to be an acceleration. And the same thing is happening here. I just wanted to show you in a negative direction. So what I want you to do real quick, pause this video right where you're at and look at these graphs below, A, B, C, and D, and tell me which one has a constant velocity. All right, now that you paused and looked at those, I'm gonna go through these real quick. So A here, we have a position time graph and it has a constant positive velocity because we have a constant slope throughout it. For B, we also have a position time graph and it has a constant velocity of zero because it has stayed at the same position the whole time, meaning it hasn't moved at all. It has a velocity of zero, but that would still be considered constant because it hasn't changed there. For C, we have a velocity time graph this time. And since we have a changing velocity based on this slope, meaning that it's changing here along this axis that is velocity, we do not have a constant velocity. We have a negative acceleration, i.e. it's going from a higher velocity here down to a lower velocity there. It's slowing down. And the last one here, D, we have a velocity time graph. And here we would have a constant velocity because we have a horizontal line at whatever velocity that would be denoted as. So I hope you got all those right. All right, next thing we need to consider when we're talking about motion is gravity. So gravity is a force generated by the mass of an object and causing an attraction with other objects of mass. We haven't talked about forces yet. That will come in the next unit, okay? So we're not going to be talking about forces today, but what's really important right here is forces cause objects to accelerate. That will be covered more in the unit two video, so check that out if you have questions on that. But accelerating objects does change the motion of those objects. So we can look right here and we can say, okay, I'm gonna drop an object. It's not just going to stay wherever you released it from, it's going to fall downwards, which means it's accelerating in a negative direction. Its velocity is going from zero to something greater than zero as it falls, and its position is also changing. Same thing is gonna happen here when you throw an object, okay? Somebody throws that object upwards, it's going to start moving upwards and eventually start moving downwards because there is an acceleration that's negative. This is known as the acceleration due to gravity. When we have objects that are flying, we define them typically as projectiles, okay? And this is what happens when gravity is considered with objects that are moving through the air. All right, so I want to define a couple spots here. We have our football player, hopefully an NC State football player, throwing to an NC State receiver and scoring a touchdown, obviously. But there are some important parts of this throw that we want to make sure to note. And you see this arrow here in the middle, and that's really what it's outlining there. That point is called the apogee, A-P-O-G-E-E, -E, the apogee. It is the highest point in the trajectory, and the trajectory is the path that you see that vector arrow being throughout there. All right. Um, the apogee is a really important point, and we'll talk about why for a couple of reasons coming up. But if we assume a horizontal plane and that these were launched and caught at the same level or launched and caught and landed on the ground at the same height, that tells us a few things. It tells us we're halfway through the path. It tells us we're at the maximum height so that there is no velocity in the Y direction. So no up and down velocity at that point. And it tells us, again, that we are at the highest point and then halfway through our overall flight. So vectors and motion and how they combine together here. We're going to use vectors to describe motion. Look back at that unit zero summary video if you need a little bit of a reminder on what vectors are. But you see right here our graph that has all of the vectors of an object, just like we looked at on the last slide, shown throughout this here. We have our gravity downwards here, and that's noted right here where we say our gravity is that constant acceleration. And on Earth, that's going to be equal to 9.8 meters per second per second in the negative direction. A reminder real quick, in physics, positive and negative are just direction. That's all that really matters there. Okay. And speaking of which, we want to note the locations where magnitudes are the same, but directions are different as we look at this vector breakdown. So we would really think about this as an object being launched with some initial velocity. But because we have an acceleration due to gravity that is only in the, hor the vertical, excuse me, the vertical direction up and down, we have to break into components here that velocity based on the angle that it's launched at in order to get our initial x and y components to the velocity, okay? Those are going to change and 
slow down, aka get smaller in the y direction until there is none in the y direction, and then increase again as that negative acceleration speeds them up moving downwards, and they're going to stay the same in the horizontal direction because gravity is not affecting them in the left and right direction. So, reminder there, acceleration due to gravity is in the vertical direction only, and that's very, very important because we need to use our vectors to separate our directions in order to summarize what's happening throughout these types of problems. So if we look at the constant variable between those two directions, there is one, right? Now, our X and Y dependent items here, the position. So if we look at this object being launched right there, the X and Y are going to be independent of each other as this moves, right? How high it is, is not going to be exactly the same as how far it's traveled. So the position is going to be different. That velocity is going to change throughout also because it's going to have some VY here, but VY here is going to be zero, right? but it's still going to be moving in this direction. So our velocities are going to be different from each other as well. And the acceleration is not going to happen at all in the X direction, but is going to be in the Y direction equal to the acceleration due to gravity. The one thing that will be constant throughout this is the amount of time it spins in the air. Whether we look at how it's moving up and down or left to right, it's going to spend the same amount of time in the air. And that is the key. So there are going to be two types of problems when you start to solve these problems, okay? Um, number one here is an object launched at an angle. It's going to be launched at some angle that's going to be denoted and then land somewhere. And oftentimes these are launched and land at the same height. They won't always be though. So we'll have to uh, get into those types of problems when we start solving some more problems later on. But realize that the launch angle will vary. And so VX and VY will both be present when it's launched. We're looking at these tips right here for number problem type number one. The apogee will be in the middle if the launch and land are at the same height. VY at that apogee will be zero. And time at the apogee will be the total time divided by two. Those are important reminders there as to how to solve that type of problem. The next type of problem will be the horizontally launched problem, where you'll see a ball maybe with some initial velocity rolled along a table that falls off the table and thus has some trajectory as it gets to the floor. In this case, because it was only moving horizontally on the table, that initial velocity in the y direction will be zero. It's not moving up and down at all, just left to right. And that means that the velocity in the y direction will be negative throughout because gravity is still pulling it downwards at that point. And the y position will be what I call a dilemma. You can do one of two things. You can either set this initial spot here along the table, apologies for the bad line, as the spot, as the uh, zero location in the y direction, and then it would just fall to a negative position. Or you could set the ground here at the bottom as the initial position, and then we would just say it starts at a specific height and then falls downwards to zero from there. That can be up to you as you start to solve these problems. A few quick tips for when you do start to solve these 2D projectile problems. Number one, draw a picture immediately. Drawing a picture and then labeling the values on that picture will be very, very helpful in your understanding of what's going on. Okay, it doesn't have to be a detailed picture. You can draw everything as little circles and squares. That's fine, but mark your angles, mark your heights, mark your velocities. That's all very important to do. Solve for what you can. If you get to a step and you say, they haven't given me enough information, then you're wrong. You're going to be given enough information to solve the problem. You just need to make sure that you solve for what you can. You might have to do two steps to get to the third step in order to finally get to the answer that you need. And finally, practice. Going through these types of problems will be by far the most helpful way to get you the practice and the experience that you need to do well on this. That's it. Thanks for being here.